While I make every effort to broadcast correct information, I'm also still learning. I will double check all my facts, but realize that healthcare is a constantly changing science and art. One doctor or healthcare provider may have a different way of doing things from another. I welcome any comments, suggestions, or correction of errors. I take no money from supplement or device companies. By listening to this podcast or reading this blog, you agree not to use this podcast or blog as medical advice or to treat any medical condition, neither yourself or others including but not limited to patients that you are treating. Consult your healthcare provider for any medical issues that you may be having. This entire disclaimer also applies to any guests or contributors to the podcast or the website. Under no circumstances shall any guests or contributors to the podcast or blog or any employees, associates, or affiliates of the Boss Body podcast be responsible for damages arising from use of the podcast or the blog. This blog or podcast should not be used in any legal capacity whatsoever, including but not limiting to, limited to establishing the standard of care in a legal sense or as a basis for expert witness testimony. No guarantee is given regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on the podcast or the blog. Hey guys, it's Dr. Tim Jackson with another episode of the Boss Body Podcast. Today, we're going to mix it up a bit. We have with us another very special guest, Dr. Ruth Roberts, DVM. Dr. Ruth Roberts is America's most loved pet health coach and the creator of the original Crock-Pot diet. She has supported thousands of dogs and cats to heal and overcome health hurdles like chronic kidney disease, GI illness, allergies, cancer, and much more. Her natural approach to, cre to healing creates a gentle yet effective path for your pet to take on its journey to well-being. Now she is making that knowledge easier to access by training and certifying holistic pet health coaches to work one-on-one -on -one with pet parents to support their pets with holistic options and home-cooked food. Welcome, Dr. Ruth. Dr. Tim, really glad to be here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, I'll tell our listeners that I brought my parents' little shipu, half shitsu, half poodle, to see Dr. Ruth. She was having some ear issues, allergy issues, and Dr. Ruth put her on the Crock-Pot diet, gave her some herbal remedies and a medication, and within three days, she was a different dog. And Gosh, now yeah. she's right at 14 and still kicking strong. So, I love and, it. And she remains on the Crock-Pot diet. So, That's so awesome. Tell us a little bit, you know, because most people probably aren't familiar with it. What exactly is the Crock-Pot diet? So, and it's actually a little play on words. It's the original croc pet diet. And, uh, it, it, and so the idea is this, if you go to buy a bag of food and you have a dog with allergies, you're going to get food with sort of a, an underlying base of vegetables and what have you that's common across all the proteins in that line. And so the goal for me was to give pet parents a really flexible recipe where if they knew their dog had sensitivities to a certain protein or their cat, or they'd done something like a life stress scan and they knew, okay, these are probably going to be food triggers. They can customize the diet specifically to what that pet needs. And the other thing is that it is cooked in batches. <clears throat> so most people are not cooking for themselves anymore. And this is a way to get somewhere between a week you know, depends on the size of the dog, obviously, but a week to uh, 10 days worth of food out of one cooking session. And because it can be frozen, uh, when, when I had, you know, five dogs and five cats, my wife and I would knock out a month's worth of food on a Sunday afternoon, about four hours of total time, put it in the freezer and we're good to go. Wow. And so what sort of symptoms have you seen both in dogs and in cats resolve with the crop pet diet? Allergies are, are a huge one because there's, because just like in people, if there is a leaky gut syndrome going on, then that means that the body is going to start picking up these inflammatory molecules and with that, they'll start attacking normal tissues. And so we see GI issues resolve, liver uh, enzyme elevation resolve, um, all sorts of pretty much anything you can think of. Kidney disease is another huge one. 
And in many cases, simply by going to cooked food, which has a terrific amount of moisture in it, we get those kidney numbers back down within normal range pretty quickly. So in the lab testing for animals, let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, I know in some ways, in terms of stealth infections like Lyme, Babesia, Bartonella, it's more advanced in veterinary medicine than it is in human medicine. But uh, what type of uh, labs would you typically run on an average pet patient? So the baselines are always going to be a complete blood count and then a general chemistry panel. The issue, actually, there are excellent Lyme and Bartonella and tests and things of that nature, but most of the time, the veterinarian is running an in-house card test, which can create a false positive and then not following up with the correct test to verify. But in, in, at any rate, you know, CBC, general chemistry panel, your analysis, these are critical to making sure where the body function is. Some of the other tests that are reliable are things like C-reactive protein. Um, this can really help us distinguish between, is this an IBS type set of diarrhea vomiting issues or is this really more just a one-off situation? So there's some really awesome ones, but those are the ones I would start with. There are a couple of labs that offer some other like vitamin D testing, um, other cancer markers, but unfortunately, they've been very unreliable. And in fact, I saw one uh, client whose dog ended up developing kidney stones because the lab had reported a falsely low value She's of vitamin D. She started the dog on vitamin D and that caused calcium to accrete in the kidney. So that was a rotten situation. Yeah. As someone who's dealt with kidney stones in the past, I can attest that they are no fun. They are extremely painful and don't underestimate them. So yeah. what are the most common causes of chronic kidney disease in dogs and cats? Frankly, dry food is, is a big one. Because if you think about the kibble, um, you cannot crush that thing between your fingers. And when people say, okay, I'll just add water to the food and they let it sit overnight, in many cases, it's still pretty hard. So there's really clear evidence, especially in cats, that cats eating canned food and versus cats eating dry food, the cats eating dry food will drink twice as much water, but they're producing only half as much urine. And what that low urine production means is that the kidneys are facing a really difficult situation to get rid of the toxins. The other thing is, just, just as you would tell your, your folks, anybody that has any experience with functional medicine, is chronic inflammation. And what that ends up doing is creating AGEs or advanced glycosylation in products that really attack the nephrons, the kidney cells, and create the scarring and fibrosis that ends up creating the kidney disease in older pets. So I know a lot of people, you know, are becoming increasingly aware of functional medicine, both for themselves and their pets. So, you know, they want to introduce healthy supplements, probiotics, anti-inflammatories, but they're, you know, unsure of the dose. They're unsure if it's safe. They don't know if the information they found online is accurate. Uh, where would you recommend people start if they want to just all around supplement for optimal health for their pets? It, so there's a couple of options. One is, I mean, there's tons and tons. And I'm going to give you products that I use uh, and created. So Holistic Total Body Support is an all-around multivitamin with glandular support in it. So we can support the entire endocrine system. And the other thing we offer is protocols or programs for specific health conditions. And those are completely free. You can reach out to my, to my peeps on uh, drruthroberts.com and they'll, they'll get you hooked up. But I think what's really important when you're researching supplements is to look at the label. And if it's a proprietary blend with rare exception, they don't tell you how much of what is in that right. supplement. And so it may all sound good, but the amounts that are needed to be truly therapeutic aren't there. And so that's where it gets really, really difficult. Yeah. And I think it's tricky because, you know, people will see, oh, it has curcumin and they know the benefits of curcumin, but they don't realize that it's not reaching that therapeutic dose to achieve optimal outcomes. And so it's sort of a bait and switch you know, right. that's why we have to be really careful with reading labels, right? 
Exactly, exactly. And the other thing is too, is that in a lot of pet products, uh, the manufacturers will put put them in chews and things like that to increase the palatability, increase the desire of the pet to actually eat the tablets. And because of that, if your pet is food sensitive, that may actually make the allergies worse. And, you know, and there's other things like dental flushes that have xylitol in them, um, that, and that's toxic to dogs. So you really, really have to be careful when you're reading labels. Yeah, absolutely. Is there a database um, you know, outside of your website, which we're definitely going to put up for folks, is there like a national or international database for pets and supplementation? There is, but unfortunately, it's more geared towards uh, practitioners. But I think it's something like the natural or uh, animal health supplement uh, site. And apologies, I don't have the, the link top of mind, but it is a great resource to say what's toxic. Um, also, if there might be herbal herb to herb interactions or herb to medication interactions, but it's a great resource to help you work through that. Right. So one thing, I don't know if, if you're able to speak to this, but a lot of people are concerned about their pets being over vaccinated and having their immune systems overstimulated at a time when they're not even developed yet. Do you have a spread out dosing protocol or do you recommend just getting the ones required by state law? Here, here's what I found most successful. And in South Carolina, we still see a lot of parvovirus. And for that reason, what I would suggest doing is keep your puppy kind of away. Don't go to dog parks. Don't have them interacting with other dogs because it is, parvo is extremely contagious. Um, and Dr. Dodds, Dr. Schultz's research, that's what I followed and so at 12 weeks, that is actually when I would start the vaccination process. And then we would repeat that vaccine at 16 weeks uh, for distemper and parvo. Now, if the, if the dog is 14 weeks or older, when you first get a vaccine for that puppy, really that one vaccine is all you need for that first year. For rabies, I generally try to get them through the distemper parvo vaccine series and repeat that two at minimum two weeks after that last vaccine. The other thing I would suggest is using Thuja, which is a, a master antioxidant or master de detoxifying agent that's used in homeopathic medicine. Um, but I use the mother tincture and there's again on the site, uh, it's a drop per 10 pounds of body weight for five, twice a day for five days. For you give the vaccine, you start the Thuja. And then this is then the, you know, once you've gone through the puppy vaccines, then the next step really is, okay, what do you do with this now adult dog 18 months later? And you can titer, which is a blood test to see how much antibody has been produced. But there are many young dogs that haven't developed an adequate um, response to the, to the vaccines. And they may, you may see that they're not fully protected. And so in that case, then we would again suggest booster the distemper parvo vaccine, again, following up with Thuja. Now, rabies, uh, that first vaccine is a one-year vaccine. And then the next one should be a three-year vaccine. And we now know from the rabies challenge study that the duration of immunity starts to drop at about four years of age uh, by about 20% of the dogs. And uh, by five years of age, it drops down something like 40%. So this is where I would suggest you can follow with titers um, for both of them. And when especially the um, rabies starts to drop down, that's where I would really consider revaccinating for a myriad of reasons. Now, the distemper and parvo vaccine, if you're going to a dog park, your dog is re-inoculating itself with every visit because it's sniffing up parvovirus. The immune system's like, oh yeah, I know what that is. I know what to do about this. Uh, distemper, we will see those titers drop in older pets, but frankly, I've not ever seen a dog over, let's say 18 months develop uh, distemper. So it, that one does not concern me as much, but blood titers are definitely the way to go. Um, there are, they are available through both of the uh, biggest veterinary labs, IDEX and Antec. So almost every uh, veterinarian would have access to be able to send in a blood titer sample.
Yeah, I mean, even I've, you know, I have a little pug, Stella, and I've gotten pushed back from her veterinarian on the vaccine stuff. And when I ask, well, why don't we run the titers? It's just like a deer in the headlight looks like it's a they don't know what to do with it. Yeah. yeah. And, and so for that reason, it's really important to go in sort of full armed with information, especially the rabies can, uh, compendium from 2016, because that one says that if a dog or a cat has ever been vaccinated against rabies, it is considered to be up to date. Uh, in the eyes of the health departments. It also does mention that titers can be an effective way to assess that individual pet's ability to fight off the virus. Well, that's great information. I know you mentioned staying away from dog parks. My little Stella, she's a social butterfly. And so she has a lot of friends in the neighborhood. Do you recommend just gradually introducing your dog, depending on age, to one new pet at a time? Or how do you recommend yeah, that, doing that? That's really a good idea. And you're right. I mean, your, Stella is just the queen of the ball. And dog parks can be an awesome resource. But if you're not sure how your dog is going to respond, I would start by inter, you know, having play dates with a, a friend and letting the dog sort of walk together while you're both walking them on leashes so they can sniff each other out. You've got a little control to make sure there's no untoward conversation going on. And then as you gain confidence, then they can start playing in the yard. Some dogs are like, hey, my new best friend. Other dogs are like, I'm not really sure about you. So you really have to assess what's going to work and not work. Right. Let's talk about this explosion. I mean, it's been happening for, well, you tell me how long it's been happening, but I've seen it for well over a decade of cancer in dogs and cats. Can you speak to that and what you believe to be the primary etiologies? I hate to say this, Tim, but it's the early spaying and neutering. So we're starting to get some research uh, showing that, I mean, because I couldn't understand it. I knew it was associated with spaying and neutering, but not how. So what's being shown in the research is that for dogs and cats that have been spayed and neutered, the luteinizing hormone levels, which is normally involved in um, you know, making the eggs viable for the female dogs, making the sperm viable for male dogs, just shoots up 20 to 30 times normal, more normal levels. And the other problem is that tissues that should not have luteinizing hormone receptors develop them in a plenty. So the bone, the joints, the adrenal glands, the brain, the bone marrow, you know, so everywhere where ca cancers can commonly pop up, we're seeing them pop up. And, and in fact, the, the main researcher that's been uh, running this was trying to get the Golden Retriever Group to help her run a study looking at medications that would block the production of luteinizing hormone to treat lymphoma. Wow. Wow. That's, and, and I hate to say it. And, you know, and then the usual suspects we think about, all of the plastics in the water, all of the uh, pollutants in the air, all of the garbage that's entered our food chain, um, the lack of exercise, obesity, uh, the anxiety level, which is also, weirdly enough, uh, associated with elevated luteinizing hormone as well. So all of those factors combined are what are the other big chunk of it. And I think in human medicine now, we're seeing that maybe 5%, maybe 10% at the outside of cancer cases are related to genetics and the rest are lifestyle choices. Yeah, I mean- I think the ad, uh, the adage, uh, genetics loads the gun, environment pulls the trigger, holds true for both human and veterinary medicine. Um, my little Stella, people always ask me, well, why isn't she fixed? Are you, are you going to breed her? Maybe, but would you perform a hysterectomy on an 11-year-old girl? No? Oh. And then, because all the dogs I know who have it done, you know, they become very lethargic. They become, you know, a ghost of their previous self. And right I, you know, I had just never believed in it. And people think I'm nuts for not doing it. Yeah. And, and I have to say, I'm guilty uh, of saying, oh, no, you must be a neuter by six months of age. And we got to about 2006 and we started seeing these cancers just crank through the roof. 
And I'm like, what in the heck is going on here? Because 20 years ago, I could take a hemangiosarcoma this big in the dog's spleen out of the body, put it in the trash, clean the abdomen up, sew it up, send it off, send a sample off to the lab. Yep, it's hemangiosarcoma. And that dog never looked back. And now when that tumor is diagnosed, sadly, most almost every dog is dead within six months. So there's been a massive shift. And some of it is environment, some of it is genetics, but I really think it's because we have compromised their en entire endocrine systems. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I see a lot of people, and I know several people who have pets with what their vets label a benign lump but right they don't send anything off to the lab so how can you really know it's benign there's there's a few that you you know your guess is really like a lipoma um some of these skin skin masses those generally are benign but it's a it's a valid question because i've had a number of clients come back you know from another vet and say oh yeah they told me this was benign three years ago and now it's this big ugly horrible thing that's really creating massive problems you know tim the other thing that's super frustrating is the statistic from the american cancer society is that 25 percent of dogs will develop cancer malignant cancer in their lifetime and 50% of dogs over the age of 10 will develop a malignant cancer. And these rates are just astronomical. I think in, in humans, it's like 0.01% or something like that. I mean, it's horrible when you get it, but the rates are just not there. And the other inter interesting thing is that in the cancer registry in Italy, when you start looking for pets, when you start looking overseas where there's not everybody spayed and neutered, it is less than, still less than 1%. So there is something really crazy going on in the U.S. Let's talk a little bit about biohacking. So I've All been right. biohacking before I think the term existed, um, right whether on. I knew it or not. Um, and I got my transcutaneous photobiomodulation device here. Right on. Biomat somewhere over there in the other room. But for pets, like I know Stella, she loves getting on the biomat. And you right know, on. intuitively, like she goes out, she gets her morning sun, right? She loves to exercise. And so I'm creating a series of emails to my list called do what Stella does, you know, and go with your intuition. Exactly. She eats. And then within an hour and a half, two hours, she has a bowel movement. She usually poops three times a day and she drinks structured water. What other biohacks are safe that people could introduce to their dogs and cats? Well, there was an article recently published uh, from, the, from a group that is studying canine aging. And what they found was that dogs that eat once a day live better, live longer, have better cognitive function. So that's certainly one of it. I think one of the things, you know, whether you go with something like a time restricted eating pattern that's only, you know, 13 hours or what have you, that's, that's a great step in the right direction. The other thing is, is that pet parents, we give treats to our dogs all the time. And what you're doing every time you do that is you're spiking the blood sugar, which is the other thing, one of the, one of the other components that will start chronic inflammation. So I think having a minimum of at least 90 minutes and better yet would be, you know, five, six hours in between meals would be super. And then compressing, instead of saying fasting, compressing the eating window down. So, so that maybe the dog eats something at two o'clock in the afternoon and then another meal, say at six o'clock, and then that's it for the day. That's a super helpful, I love PEMF mats, Assisi loops. Um, they have the individual loops for specific problems, but they also have the full body uh, mats that you're discussing. So bio, um, excuse me, pulse electromagnetic frequency to help improve biological balance. Uh, using supplements that are going to really gear into uh, dropping our inflammation level down. So high doses of omega-3 fatty acids. C60 is really cool. I don't know if you have experience with that, mm -hmm. but that is an awesome product because it is a literally 
a magnet for free radicals. And, you know, it's just it is super awesome. And especially for pets that have food sensitivities, it's a great one to go to. Um, and then making sure you at minimum have filtered water. So in our water supply is all sorts of chemicals we don't want to think about being there, but they're there. So it's important not to just have like a Brita pitcher, but something that will take out heavy metals, PCBs, um, drugs, all these, all this stuff that's in our water supply and microplastics. And that's, I mean, there's a huge, huge list, but that's, that's a great start. You can also look at something like for, particularly for older pets, something like uh, small doses of MCT oil to help improve cognitive function by feeding the brain. I mean, we can just go, go on and on and on. We don't have as many cool devices for dogs and cats, but we're working on it. Right. Yeah, I see, especially equine veterinarians using PEMF, laser, you know, and in some ways, I think it was easier for them to adopt than human physicians and healthcare providers because there's not as much pushback. Oh, are there 90,000 studies? You know, has it been used for 40 years? You know, that's exactly, sort of exactly. The question is, did it help or did it not help? And when the overwhelming answer is yes, it helped, then it gets into, into practice. Right. And with the C60, so I'm very familiar with that in terms of a brand for dogs. Do you have a brand on your site? We, we're, I've been partnering with them. And in fact, um, we're going to be putting it on our site shortly, but it's, it's the purple power. Uh, C60. They are just, uh, Jess and Ken have done a fantastic job at presenting the data, the science, and and making an, an extremely high quality product. That's awesome. And so I know it, in humans, at least, it can help with hair growth. It can help with skin health, immune health, weight loss. I mean, the list is a mile long. And right on. I know the studies were done in rodents, but, you know, if it was a high quality lifespan increased by 60% or something. Exactly. I mean, it's crazy. So for instance, we've got a 14 year old cat, Pepe, and he was starting to act like a 14 year old cat. Uh, so we started C60 in June for him. And then about two months later, he's acting like his eight year old, crazy, obnoxious self. And for a little dog, Hayo, she had a fracture in her leg. And uh, so she walks kind of funny because the leg is shorter and turned out. The number of times we've had to treat her for, for neck and thorax spine pain has diminished to almost nothing. And we were having to use the CC loop and all this other stuff and an occasional dose of a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory to make her comfy. So this has been a huge benefit and helped me out tremendously too, as far as reducing overall inflammation, helping my brain function, improve all those good things. Awesome. Well, that that's great information. Do you have any recommendations for horse owners out there? Well, there's a couple of things. And actually the other thing I should mention as well for dogs and for horses uh, is CBD a high quality version of it. Uh, there's a ton of them out there. A lot of them are garbage, but CBD at relatively higher doses than you're accustomed to thinking about. And again, you want to have this in an oil-based product um, because that way it gets into the system more easily. Mm -hmm. The one I've been using is nano emulsified. So it really is able to get into the bloodstream quickly. But because our pets are endocrine incompetent, this is one of the tools we can use to really help support them. Same thing for horses. This has made a massive difference for a number of horses to feel better, um, downregulate some of the issues that might come up with Cushing's, chronic colics, things like that. Um, and horse medicine, to be fair, I, I haven't done in probably 25 years now, but that's, that's a home run for sure. Yeah, one thing I wanted to ask you about, and you know, I worked for the equine veterinarian that you know when I was in high school, and we did a lot of colic surgery. Well, he did the surgery, I just assisted. But right um, it was extremely common. And, you know, once I learned about mold and mycotoxins and hay and grains, I started putting this stuff together. And so I wanted to ask you, is there a connection? Yeah, I would think so. I mean, mycotoxins really muck things up. 
uh, whether that's horses with their hay, grains, et cetera, et cetera, or dogs that are eating a corn-based diet, because corn is one of the most common places where you'll find aflatoxins and other mycotoxins. So right. that's critical to pay attention to what you're feeding. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think mycotoxins, you know, if you can train a dog to detect when your blood sugar is going to drop or someone's about to have a seizure, then you can be dang sure that they're going to be impacted by mycotoxins, EMFs, and things of that nature. And I think the mycotoxins are probably also playing a role in the rise in cancer, right? It, it probably has some connection too. I mean, the, the, uh, the overall level of environmental contamination is just so frustrating. But to be fair, I think that we wouldn't be seeing the level of cancer we're seeing currently if if more pets were still intact. Right, right, absolutely. So where do you see the future of, you know, I tell people I want to teach you and the biggest honor you can give me, yes, I love referrals, but teaching other people about what I've taught you. So I see pet owners sort of becoming you know, their dog's doctor in a sense, you know, not performing surgery or anything like that, but being in charge of their health and helping them navigate life. So is that Absolutely. where you see things headed? Absolutely. I mean, we, we gave away, we abdicated really our personal responsibility for our own health and for our pet's health. And, you know, my profession encouraged that because we don't want, we don't want you to ask us questions. We don't want you asking us about titers, right? So I think learn things, um, share that with your friends, share that with your neighbors. And, and honestly, too, part of what I'm doing right now is training people to be holistic pet health coaches. And what I'm doing is giving them the tools to understand the physiology, the normal anatomy, um, functional medicine, traditional Chinese veterinary medicine, and then giving giving them breakdown by organ system and uh, specific ways we can apply those combined with healthy whole foods to really make a massive impact on these pets health. Absolutely. So you've really, one of the primary themes I've gotten from everything you've said is overarching toxicity. And so when in human medicine, you know, I recommend all my clients and patients do some form of lymphatic therapy, whether it's a vibration plate, a rebound, rebounder, dry skin brushing. Uh, are those safe for pets? I mean, obviously they're not going to do rebounding, but. And they might. They, <laughs> there's they, a lot of, there's a lot of videos of uh, pit bulls and uh, boxers on, uh, on trampoline. So maybe, <laughs> but, but yeah, brushing. Um, so there, are, you know, for instance, simple twi knot, which is a form of Chinese body work, just rubbing the skin, getting things moving. Uh, walking, I mean, that does a tremendous amount to move the lymphatic system, brushing, uh, brushing the hair, uh, brushing the skin, basically. Anything that gets things to move, that's critical. Um, I, I wonder if dogs would get on a vibration plate or if that would be too intense. There should be a video on YouTube somewhere about that. We're about to find yeah. out because mine should be here in three days. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to look for that and see if Stella is grooving on it or not. Right on. Yeah, I bought her a skateboard for Christmas. But um, she was she's so hyperactive. She didn't really want to stay on. So I gave it to my neighbor's dog. Um, right on. But, you know, hopefully we can get her YouTube channel up and going soon because, you know, she she's definitely a star. But um, one thing I wanted to ask you in terms of immune function as dogs and cats age, you know, one of the products you mentioned, you said it has all the glandulars in it. Does it have the thymus glandular as well? This one does not have thymus, but that's where I like to use standard processes, thymus uh, extract, because it's, it's a superior product, no doubt about it. Right. Absolutely. And so for people out there who want to optimize their pet's health, what's something that you, or two things that you know today that you really wish you would have known 15 years ago? The impact of whole fresh foods. I mean, there's just, there's no other option. If you can't get down to cooking uh, for your pet or it's gonna be a while before you can get there, go get a bag of frozen uh, Normandy blend veggies, grab a handful out, throw it in a pot of boiling water, cook that up, 
cook it till it's actually a little mushy and put that over your pet's food. If you do nothing else, you're going to start to see a dramatic change in how they look and feel. The other thing is how to how to find other options to the prescription drugs. And you know, and sometimes we just need them, but the vast majority of us can use a workaround solution. So for allergies, you could use quercetin. For pain, you could use Arnica tablets like tea relief tablets. So that's really the thing is taking the time to see, okay, what does this medication do and what else can we use in place of it? And that's, that's so critical. I think we just, we have to really keep that as top of mind rather than going straight for what the vet sends home. Absolutely. And in terms of like, let's say I find a lump on my dog, uh, in terms of treatment options for cancer, how, I mean, traditional veterinary medicine, what, what's their common go-to treatment? It depends on the, on the cancer itself. I mean, obviously, if it's something that can be cut out, surgery is number one. If, uh, you know, for things like lymphoma, that's where things, you know, cyclo, uh, cyclophosphamide, uh, prednisone, those kind of drugs will be used. And, and then really, we do have a few of the immune products available. Uh, Palladia is one of them, but you know they, they all do come with a cost. When they work, there are a few cases where that's where I would really suggest using that in combination with whole cooked food and other supplements to support the body and also to help improve killing off the cancer cells. Absolutely. So it's been so great having you. You've been a wealth of knowledge. Any last tidbit you'd like to leave our listeners and viewers with? Yeah, trust your instincts. If something is telling you that what's coming out of the vet's mouth is not going to work for your dog, just say, can I think about this? And then go do some research. Get an opinion from somebody else that can help guide you through that. Take your time. And there, there are situations where you can't do that in an emergency situation, but most of the chronic disease situations take a deep breath and say, may I get back to you on that? Absolutely. Where can people find you? We're going to post the links, but. Right on. Uh, DrRuthRoberts.com. That's the easiest way to, to find me. And um, you can go check out our protocols. Uh, if you get signed up with us, we'll send you all sorts of cool stuff. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Ruth, for being here. Thanks for the work you're doing. It's such important work. And I know people are hungry for it, no pun intended. And hopefully we can have you back on again in the future. That would be wonderful, Tim. Thanks so much for what you're doing too, getting the info out there. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day. Will do.